Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Multidimensional Nerd. I am he, the nerd, and I want to talk with you guys about Avatar, The Way of Water. Uh, this film is very near and dear to my heart. It is sort of a uh, restorative hope in the film world for me uh, after seeing some of the crap that's come out of Hollywood recently and there have actually been a few of those. I've, I've been pleasantly surprised with a lot of the movies that have been coming out recently but also for someone that was really just mystified by the first movie and the first movie goes down on my list of things as one of my favorite movies of all time. I've probably watched that movie more uh, over the last few years going back to it again and again um, for various different reasons that whenever the time came for the second one to come out. I just, I could not wait. And I've now seen it three times in theaters. I've seen it in good old 3D, real D 3D. I've seen it in 2D and I have seen it uh, in Dolby 3D, which if you're gonna go see this movie, you need to go see it in the Dolby 3D. I know that it's actually formatted for IMAX. That might not mean anything to those of you that aren't film nerds like I am, but let me break that down for you. So IMAX has a certain aspect ratio, a certain way that it's supposed to work with the lenses and all of this stuff. I'll save you all of that and just tell you that the way that IMAX is formatted is for a certain size screen and Dolby is just slightly smaller than that. However, Dolby has two things over IMAX that IMAX just doesn't provide you. The first one is deeper color contrast, which means you get more rich depth in your picture. And at the end of the day, we're going to the cinema. The idea is that we get to go and see really pretty moving pictures that help tell a story. That's only 40% of our viewing experience though. The other aspect of this is uh, the sound. IMAX only provides you with 12 channels of sound. This is still over what you have with your surround sound and your 7.1 and all of that stuff. The Dolby cinemas are equipped with Dolby Atmos. Dolby Atmos is the revolutionary sound stuff that allows you to hear things like how the waves sort of crash over the entire theater. You can program Dolby Atmos to where through each of the 64 channels, the sound can be pinpointed in a 3D mapped space virtually to make sure that you hear exactly what you're supposed to hear when you're supposed to hear it, regardless of where you're sitting at in the theater. That's really special, as well as the fact that Dolby has the interactive seating, so sometimes you'll be able to like feel the reverberation from gunfire in the seating itself. It has really comfortable reclining seats, as well as just the, it, it captures the old school sense of what it might have meant to go to the cinema before we became attuned to it, before we, we became numb to the, to the majesty of what the cinema is. And James Cameron even talks about how going to the cinema is not about the big screen, as cool as that is. Going to the cinema, especially now today whenever you have like 85 inch TV screens and projectors that you can project on your wall at home, no, it's not about the size of the screen. In many ways, it's more about the commitment to sit down and immerse yourself without distraction in an experience. And it's an experience that I think that the way of water really gives us in a, in a new light. So I want to talk about it and we're going to give you the, the good old good, bad and ugly. So the first thing I want to talk about when it comes to the good are the performances. You cannot beat the performances. Let me get this out of the way now before I get into anything else because uh, the messages are great, the storylines are great, and I want to talk about all of those things, but at the end of the day, the reason why we come back to franchises especially is because we love the world and we love the characters. The storylines change. The the drives, the motivations, all of these things, they, they, they shift and they flow just like our lives do. We, we encounter different parts of our lives, and so we're going to encounter different parts of these stories but the reason why we come back is because we're invested in the characters and those characters are brought to life by actors. And so I want to highlight a few of them. Um, the first one is Bailey Bass. Bailey Bass uh, plays Tsirea, who is the chief of the water people's daughter. Okay, She is the daughter of the water chief tribe. And I'm going to talk about the, the chief in a second. But Tsirea plays a pivotal role with our newest characters to this. She is a new character along with them, but she plays a pivotal role as 
the guide for these people that are leaving the Omatakaya clan and coming to uh, the Metkayini clan. And this is a, a huge deal because she's the one that's teaching them the way of water, really. And, and that comes down to a lot of things, both on a practical level, a way of breathing and a way of looking at the world, but also uh, philosophies for life that come specifically from how the Metkayina clan has had to learn to interact with the world because of the environment that is their home, and that are these these reefs on this string of islands on Pandora. So Bailey Bass brings that to life great. She has this innocence to her that is very uh, appropriate for how young she is. However, she is also very wise, and she sees things and trusts things and chooses to believe in people at just the right moment when no one else is willing to believe in them, and specifically with Loak, who is sort of our new main character. He's, he's stepping into the role. And if you've been keeping up with Avatar at all, you know that in the third Avatar movie, Loak is actually going to be our narrator. It is no longer going to be Jake Sully. And we can talk about all of my theories and everything like that. I'll have an entire video for theories about where I think this story is going in the future. But we're with Bailey's character and her portrayal of this character, she provides this perfect balance for Loak, especially, and that is because she is uh, the sort of cautious and wise, but still sprightly and smart, uh, counterbalance to Loak's uh, brash leadership. Loak is going to be a wonderful leader. He's going to be an absolutely wonderful um, uh, warrior one day. However, he needs to grow up. And this story is very much his story of growing up, him facing the consequences of real life and realizing that things aren't all hunky-dory all the time the way that we might want them to be. And he pays a real price for it. But ultimately, the person that stays by his side, both at the beginning of all of this through sort of childish infatuation, but then sort of grows through uh, how Loak begins to adopt the way of water into himself and becomes one of the of the Metkayina clan, um, Sirea's performance, Sirea's ability to influence that and her future endeavor to, inv to influence and be part of Loak's life is going to be quintessential to the telling of this story. And it's going to be a longer form version of watching Jake and Natiri fall for each other, watching how in many ways they are already infatuated with each other, but watching Sirea and Loak actually fall and then become dedicated to each other is going to be something really, really wonderful to watch. Uh, next, I want to talk about Tonawati. Tonawati is Cliff Curtis's character, and he is the only member of the cast that I am aware of that is actually from a water-like tribe historically. He is uh, one of the Maori, and Cliff is absolutely fantastic in this from a perspective of being the strong leader. And that's actually mentioned in the story. It's that Jake Sully says, I knew that Tonawati was a strong leader, but that's not who I was who I was worried about. And yet we see a reason to be worried about Cliff. We see a reason to to be worried about Tonawati as an individual. Um, and that is, or, or not be worried, but to appreciate him and to understand why there might be some fear about him. And that is because he is a man that is under control. There is nothing that can get under this guy's skin save for the deepest cultural impacting things that, are, that, that could possibly happen to their people. But also, it comes in the form of his children and the protection of the of his people and his wife and that's very fascinating to me we we see him go through this testing one of, one of the times that we see some real dynamicism in Tonawati's character is when we see him go through this testing where Loak again um, has done something that is sacred to the Metkayina people in a way that breaks how sacred the tradition is. That's all I'm going to say about it. And I'm going to say also that, that Loak is right. But for the sake of tradition, Tonawati is trying to, to teach this outsider who is not his child, who is 
been having conflicts with his own children in this way, while also obviously being infatuated with his daughter, um, has to try and, and get a point across to Loak. And there's this fantastic scene um, where Loak uh, comes in and after having committed something, and Tonawadi figures it out, and he's trying to tell him why what he did was wrong. Tonawadi is trying to, to teach this boy why what he did was wrong. Not just that it was wrong. He's not trying to pull one of those things, well, it's because I said so. He's trying to say, this is the reason why. This is the sacred thing that you have, ha have infringed upon. And so Loak's not getting it, and so he tells Loak to sit down. He's very calm. You can tell he's getting agitated, and it's very interesting how they do this in the animation and in the motion capture. But you can tell he's getting agitated, and he tells him to sit down. So Loak, and, and Loak complies, and Loak and Tonawadi both sit down. But then the other kids that are present, the other kids that are sort of witnessing this, they don't sit down. And for that moment, Tonawadi snaps, and he yells at them, and he tells them to sit down. And then with a simple measure, he goes... And he regains his calm. He loses it for a fraction of a moment. And then he just dispels his frustration with a breath. And he pulls himself back into it. And it makes me wonder about how many fathers might watch this and might think, hmm, I wonder if I took that approach instead. There's a time for, for frustration, there's a time for anger, but it's what we do with it that matters. And I think that Tonawadi is a really cool character for that. So thank you, Cliff Curtis, for, for providing that fantastic performance. And then finally, to the most uh, controversial performance of everybody, out of anybody on the cast, and that is with Sigourney Weaver. Sigourney Weaver is back, and she is playing an extremely interesting character named Kitty, who is essentially conceived by Eowa. They, you, you figure this out within the first several minutes of the of the movie. Um, when in the first movie, when Sigourney Weaver dies, and they try and transfer Sigourney Weaver's soul through Eowa into her old body, she's too weak to make it, and we all think that she's dead. Well. It's obvious that that's not exactly what happened, and we see all of, and this is where I'm going to get a little bit conspiratorial, because none of this is confirmed in the movie. However, in my opinion, it's very obvious for us to see how Aoa didn't, Sigourney Weaver, so Grace, Augustine, didn't have the the strength left in her as she died, to make it all the way for her soul to completely embody her, her avatar. And so what Aowa does, or what happens in this ritual, is that her avatar gets impregnated with the soul of Grace Augustine. And then later, I don't know how long the, the, the I'm assuming that it's nine months for the not be, but um, sometime later, the alive but sort of brain dead body of Grace's avatar gives birth to this very alive baby named that is named Kitty and then Kitty is adopted by Jake and Natiri Sigourney Weaver in this movie has to come back and play a 13 14 year old version of herself okay this is a woman who is she is i believe in her 7th year let me look this up real fast um, I think that she is in her seventh year of life, or seventieth year of life. Um, and it's it's fascinating to me. Um, yeah, she's seventy three. Yeah, she's 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 seventy three years old, and is able to channel this very childlike energy. And some people are like, oh, I'm not buying it. Oh, she seems always too old. Well, it's also justifiable by the character because Kitty is more attuned with Eowa than just about anybody else. But she sells it enough to where it's almost unheard of to believe that that is somebody who is as old as she is acting alongside these other kids and being that young and, and that... Um, excited and everything. And it really just shows the, the breadth of what Sigourney Weaver is able to do. As you've had such a long acting career as she has, you can understand how this um, idea of being young and impressionable 
could be a new frontier for an older actress, getting to go back in time. All of the time you're asking, well, can you play a little bit older? Well, can you play a little bit older? Well, can you play a little bit older? And and to have this moment where you're in this, this age where you should be playing the older wise and woman, and yet now you're being pulled back into being this young character with all of these quirks and all these flaws and all of this room for growth. I can only imagine how exciting that is for uh, for Sigourney. There are plenty of uh, of interviews with her out there about this, but I think that she did absolutely fantastic. Hey guys, if you like this episode and you guys want more of this, make sure that you hit the follow button or the like and subscribe button, depending on whether you're on Rumble or YouTube. If you want exclusive content, if you want to see some short films that have been made by both us and other people that we know, and eventually help us get to the point where we can start making our own feature film content, make sure you go to forerunnerproductions.locals.com. And also, if you want Forerunner Productions merch, or if you want to help support and invest bigger funds, or if you want access to scripts and stuff like that, that, make sure you go over to forerunnerproductions.com. We've got all sorts of options for people to be able to uh, invest and be a part of the storytelling process that we're going on. We know that you want better stories and we're here to try and help you provide them, but we need your help. So make sure that you go over to either forerunnerproductions.locals.com or forerunnerproductions.com and check out all the content that we're making. We'll see you in the next one.